Are you tired of being overcharged and forced into paying a monthly subscription for your Mac and Windows software? Well, if you are, currently we're having a 50% off discount on all the latest Mac and Windows software, such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Photoshop, Microsoft Office, and much more. Our 50% off discount will be ending soon, so be sure to text us Need Software to 213-640-9738. That's 213-640-9738. We aim to please, so expect 24-7 technical support, the latest premium software, instant software links delivered to your email, and PayPal buyer's protection guarantee. The white supremacists use division as a weapon, dividing our families, our wealth, rewarding traitors, murdering heroes. Yet we survived. We fought for our reparations. Now it's our turn to divide and administer God's power. I am Agent Nuria Sellers, a foundational black American. I promise that nothing will come between us. Buy the sci-fi novel, Nothing Will Come Between Us. Available January 22nd. Pre-order online today at Amazon and Google Play. Spirit of 1811publishing.com. Our story, our family. This Black Friday, we are having more than just sales going on. We are giving away free cheese. Buy two, get one free. Buy a hoodie, get one free. Buy a sweatshirt, get one free. Guess what else is free? Shipping! 30 days of Christmas specials start on Black Friday and runs to Christmas Eve. Come see what all the fuss is about at blackeldervoices.com. Racism is the most powerful system on the planet. Yet it is often perceived as the most taboo subject to discuss. World-renowned activist and best-selling author Tariq Nasheed takes on this challenge head-on in his new book, Foundational Black American Race Baiter. This is the most important book you will need in order to understand the mechanisms of systemic racism and how to counter this system. Get Foundational Black American Race Baiter now at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Also get limited autographed collector's editions of the book at officialfba.com. Are you interested in natural and organic skin and hair care products? Then visit us at frostedbodyshop.com to learn more. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Frosted Body Shop. That's Frosted Body Shop. My name is Black Ice. And I'm Akees. And we're the Black Narrative. We are a Black First and Hebrew Israelite channel on YouTube that broadcasts live every Tuesday and Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Every week we discuss controversial issues and challenge false narratives that are fed to Black people through mass media. We share our research through videos and encourage uncomfortable conversations amongst the Black community. Look at the Black Narrative on YouTube or go to our website www.theblacknarrative.tv. Shalom. Shalom. I'm here. What's going on with y'all, man? How's everybody doing? Welcome to Tariq Radio Live on the Sunday broadcast. We're here, ready to make it do what the hell we do. I got on my player shirt for y'all. All right, we're here. Everybody come on in the room. Rise up and let's chop it up. Oh, boy, I'm worn out. Boy, I had a long weekend, man. It's been a heavy weekend for Dr. Nasheed, all right? Man, I've been putting in work. We were working on the new film that we're doing, the new documentary film about the Maroons. We were filming all day yesterday. Boy, film days are a beast. And we had a huge cast and crew. I'll get on that in a minute. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Oh, yeah, the NFT. We got some buck-breaking NFTs coming out this week. We got some buck-breaking artwork um, commemorating the movie Buck Breaking. You guys will get a chance to own some artwork inspired by the hit documentary film Buck Breaking. Very important that we start documenting things and putting them in the historic record. 
That's what I like about the NFT thing. You can put those things in, you can record them, you can officially record certain things. That's why it's so hot right now. Yeah, you can officially record certain things, certain items, and they'll have value um, later, now, or whatever. But there's a that's a great thing. I, I like that thing. I like that NFT um, wave that's happening. A lot of folks don't understand it. And there, there's a lot of things to, to, to understand and learn about it. But we got the buck-breaking NFTs coming sometime this week. So you guys stay tuned for that. And also, we have some new stocked books of the hardcover i wish i had one in here the hardcover copies that's going to be autographed and signed of the foundation of black american race beta book at official fba.com you can get the book on amazon.com but if you want the autographed hard copies which will be collector's editions ladies and gentlemen you can get those now at official fba.com we ran out a couple of weeks ago so now we are restocked and you can get a signed autograph copy. Get my signature on that. And you can pass that down, ladies and gentlemen. You understand? So let, let's talk about some of the things we need to get into today. Um, everybody, I need you to hit the like button. Hit that thumbs up button. You see that thumbs up button? Hit that thumbs up button. YouTube has taken off the dislike button button thing where you can you can't see the dislikes I kind of like when you can see dislikes because that lets me know what channel to go on and what channel has whack information sometimes the dislike button and sometimes you got people who will hit the dislike button just because they're trolling we, we've had that many times every time we go live we got the um, the butter biscuit eaters and the mayonnaise eaters all hitting the dislike button just on GP but sometimes when I, I see videos and I'm scrolling through videos and I see a lot of dislikes, I'm already, I already know that it's, it's about to be some funny style. So that kind of helps me out. You know. But nevertheless, everybody hit the like button. And if you have not subscribed, we almost got 180,000 subscribers. Let's get to 200,000 subscribers. All right. Let's get to 200,000 subscribers. If you have not subscribed, ladies and gentlemen, share this page and share this channel so that we can get a hundred, no, so we can get 200,000 subscribers. Share this channel, share this page, share my YouTube um, profile so we can get 200K subscribers. We should have 200K subscribers by now. You understand? So we need to get 200K subscribers to the show. So let's make that happen. I think we can do that tonight. If everybody just hit that subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. Shout out to Atlanta. I got to come down to Atlanta soon because we do, we, we need to do some more pickup shots and I want to do them down in Atlanta. Um, I, I want to talk to my Atlanta people who's in the film industry down there so I can um, know all the locations out there and know the scouts and I need y'all to really holler at me. And also, my man at um, Nubian Bookstore, um, he wants me to come down there to do a book signing. And I've been wanting to come down to Atlanta, you know, just to vibe with my Atlanta family. I do got to come to Dallas, too. I have to come to Dallas. I absolutely have to come to Dallas. But I got to go down there to Atlanta. Atlanta, I love Atlanta. Atlanta's doing the right thing in a lot of areas. I like that they, they got the Black Wall Street market down there. Love that. Love that. Love that. I love that, man. Atlanta, a lot of you are doing the right thing out there. A lot of people got the right idea, and I like that. A lot of people are going in the right direction. I want to keep that wave going. That's why I've been, you know, kind of contemplating about putting the museum there. I still, you know, we're going to, you know, put it out here. But with all of the all of the political stuff happening out here, I've been really, really seriously thinking about putting the museum in Atlanta first. I know I'm going to eventually put a museum in Atlanta. So we've been, I've been kicking that idea around, but I really want to do some good business with my family out there in Atlanta. You dig? I really want to do good business with the Atlanta family. Atlanta, they, they, they got the right mindset. Enough of them have the right, right mindset. Um, out here in LA, man, it's, it's kind of funny style out here in LA. Right now, you know, you got the race soldiers, 
um, out here running the shit like a gang. And also, man, what, let, me, let me talk to my L.A. family for a minute. Let me talk to the L.A. players for a minute. Because out here, and, and not just L.A., I'm not just going to talk about L.A. in other places too, but we got, because of economic deprivation, the streets are a little more thirsty. And when, you know, we got a lot of homeless black people out here, a lot of the hustles have dried up. It's when you are economically deprived, you can be co-opted by the dominant society more easily. And one thing I, I'm tired of seeing, which I think is kind of cowardly to me at this point, this whole thing, we, we know who the enemy is. We know who the enemy is. We know who the oppressor is. And out here, they, another rapper out here, a, a week ago, they killed Slim 400. They killed him. Up and coming rapper. They killed that brother. They killed 400. Now, Drakeo. They didn't kill this guy. They killed Drakeo, the ruler. They didn't kill this brother. They killed, he died. Somebody stabbed him at one of his performances out here in LA. Um, look, family, that, that shit is corny, to be honest, man. You know, and, and down there in Memphis, you know, they, they got Dolph. And, and I'm not, again, I'm not just talking about um, L.A., but this whole shit where niggas, you're targeting the up-and-coming rapper and the up-and-coming up and black person, that shit is corny. That, that's corny. And it's cowardly. Yeah, yeah, Draco got stabbed. They stabbed him. Man, look. Look. Was Draco, was he signed to Empire Records as well? And that's another thing. All these rappers signed to Empire getting killed. Uh, that's a hell of a coincidence. That's a hell of a coincidence. But brothers, listen, that is cowardly. That is cowardly at this point, man. That that shit is corny. You, you, you dig? Man, niggas will take those penitentiary chances to stab up or kill another brother. But boy, when the dominant society, when somebody outside of the community does something, all of a sudden niggas don't know what to do. Oh, Lord. We're going to have to march. Huh? Of someone and this and uh, okay, yeah, I know, I, I know, Jay, I, I heard, I, I know, I know, I know, and 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 Drayton, my man, you made a good point. You made a good point. You, somebody in the room said, "Well, he did this, he did that." I get it, I get it, and and I say this to a lot of the up and coming rappers too. Let me say this too. Let me say this to a lot of the up and coming rappers because somebody made a good point. They say, dude was out here playing around, you know, saying this, dissing cats and disrespecting, whoop de whoop. So you don't play with fire either. Look, a lot of dudes, man, when you got a wave going, and this is the trick bag, this is the this is the evil dichotomy. You rap about the streets to get that blow up. You you kind of blow up, start rapping about what's going on in the streets, but but you're trying to move to another level. You're rapping about what's happening in the streets and how gangster you are, but you're trying to go to another level. But you want to seem authentic. So you want to get out here and start talking all that shit in the streets to seem authentic. Yeah. So a lot of cats, man, y'all can't do it. Y'all can't have it both ways, man. It don't work like that. It don't work like that, man. It, that's You're going to always fall off. That's why my brother, Ice-T, was very successful at what he did. And he was the, the father of modern gangster rap. Ice-T got out of the street shit to talk about it. And he famously said, look, I ain't got nothing to prove. I ain't, you know, I'm, I'm square now. I have nothing to prove. But I'll talk about what went on back in the day. And I always talk about it in... Um, and I put a period at, on the end of it, meaning that when I talk about somebody doing some gangster shit, I talk about what happens to them when they do the gangster shit. 
So when you listen to the Six in the Morning records or some of the other Ice-T records, um, High Roller and records like that, when he's talking about niggas in the game, he talks about dudes getting killed too. You understand? So Ice-T did it right. Ice-T did it right. He talked about it. But he talked about the negative impact of it and why you shouldn't do this shit. You know? Ice-T was a hustler. Let's be very clear. Ice-T was a for real hustler. So he wasn't no gangster, but he was a hustler. You understand? Ice was a hustler. For real, for real. He was a true-to-the-game hustler. See, that's the thing. Wasn't trying to prove that he was the most gangster nigga. Yeah? Wasn't trying to prove he was the most gangster dude. But he did it the right way. And that's what you do, fellas. Man, if you're trying to get into the music industry, you gonna have to, you can't have one foot in the music industry and one foot out here um, on the block talking that bullshit. You dig? It's just not going to work like that, guys. It's not going to work like that. Yeah, Easy, Easy wasn't in the streets no more. He got out the game. Easy wasn't in the streets no more, but he had somebody write about, hey, this is what I, I used to do. He once he started getting out the game and started getting into the music industry, he left the street shit alone, as he should. Yeah. A lot of dudes be trying to mix the two. Um, what's my dude who got killed out there? And I'm, well, it was, it was a, it was a, so many rappers get killed, but the cat who got killed in Texas. Some of these dudes, you know, they they got a rap career going, but in order to floss on the gram. See, understand, when these up-and-coming rappers are on the gram flashing all that money, some of these, these niggas are still kind of trapping. You know, they're they still out here in the streets doing shit. They're not getting no rap money yet because they haven't even broke yet. A lot of them are local. A lot of them have somewhat of an, an internet following, but they haven't really broke yet. So a lot of these dudes out here all flashing around online and they're rapping, but these niggas out here doing some little street business. Yeah, yeah, y'all yeah, saying the guy's name. So, yeah. Let me tell you something. A lot of dudes who's in the streets for real, when they see niggas doing all of that flossy shit on the internet and you're doing some street business with them, a lot of dudes on the street, they, they're side-eyeing niggas. They're like, hey, man, this nigga's, you know, he's... He's blowing up, but I don't want this nigga to get to a point where, you know, he's bringing too much attention to shit. You know? A lot of dudes don't want to do business with somebody who's who's bringing too much attention to what's going on. Niggas start um, rapping about shit, and you like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I went to my plug's house on 3rd Avenue, and uh, hey, whoa, and the, and the plug is like, hey, nigga, don't put my name in your raps, man. No, hey, you, you know what I'm saying? I'm telling you how the street niggas think. Niggas start to try to, they try to be authentic, and then they start kind of talking too much on these records. Yeah? So a lot of dudes who ain't trying to rap, a lot of dudes who ain't trying to get a deal or whatever, niggas like, hey, man. Don't be rapping about where the, where the trap is, dude. Don't do that. Yeah. So, little Jimmy Bricks, whoever the little, the, the, the local re-up man is, Jimmy Bricks, he low-key. Jimmy Bricks is low-key. So, Jimmy Bricks ain't trying to get no record deal. He's like, yeah, you know, just give me my money. I'm going to send you this package. Give me my money. So, you give... You, you out here giving work to Lil Moisture or whoever the rapper is. Jimmy Bricks is out here giving some, some work to Lil Moisture. And Lil Moisture is flipping the work. And then he gets the, the money that he's supposed to give to Jimmy Bricks. Lil Moisture is on the internet holding the money phone. Like, yeah, nigga, I'm getting it. Nigga, I'm, you see how a nigga like me getting it? My new mixtape, nigga like me getting it coming out soon. And Jimmy Bricks is like, motherfucker, you better bring that money to me. That's my money. <laughs> Jimmy Bricks is like, nigga, get my money off the internet, motherfucker, before you get my money confiscated. Nigga, you're going to get my money taken by the damn feds. Nigga, get my money off the internet. <laughs> Little moisture. 
You dig? So yeah. <laughs> Lil Moisture is making the block hot doing all that shit. <laughs> So yeah, Jimmy Briggs is like, hey man, we're gonna have to, you know, this nigga that made the block hot. I don't want them to, the the them folks to come take that money that he owed me. Then he's rapping, yo, little moistness to shit. I go to Jimmy Bricks, I get the re up. So it's oh, oh, oh nigga, don't be rapping about me, nigga. Don't put my name in your raps. All right, we got to handle this little old nigga. Come on, little moisture. So you can't be rapping about Jimmy Bricks and all of these dudes flossing your re-up money. Because that's what these niggas be doing. They be flossing their little re-up money. That's the shit they be doing. They get they flip that bag. They go break that shit down and get all the money. Now, they just going to get a little cut of it. But they get all the, the money and be all on the internet knowing they got to get a shit to Jimmy Bricks. They got to get that money to Jimmy Bricks. And they going to get like a little old percentage of that. So, yeah, niggas be doing the most. So, yeah, y'all got to cut that. Chill out with that shit, man. Yeah, chill out with that. You know, we got to be smart in this game. You ain't got nothing to prove. You don't have to prove your authenticity, man. I mean, goddamn. I want brothers to say, hey, man, look, I was in the game. I got out the game. Just get out the game and do you. Be okay to say, hey, man, I ain't doing this street shit no more. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be around here dissing niggas and, you know, cut all that corny shit out. Now, look, I, I diss folks, but I always keep it in a humorous thing. You dig? I keep it in a humorous place, you know, because I don't want to seem like I'm a hypocrite. Now, I've ran up on motherfuckers before, you know, to test that. But, you know, but I, I, I ran up on some man to man. I'm not going to ambush no nigga. I'm not going to sneak nobody. You know, if, and I don't, I don't recommend that either. I don't recommend that either. But I'm gonna run up if I run up, or holler at somebody. It's gonna be on some man to man. Me, you, nigga. Let's move this little furniture around and do what you and I need to do. I'm not gonna be sneaking you at a concert and shooting your grandmama house. No, 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 no. You got a problem? Um, you talking this and that, nigga? Let's let's move that little chair around and um, you know, let's move the crowd, nigga. But. A lot of these dudes going around here dissing different neighborhoods. A lot of these niggas trying to take the Takashi route. And that's the thing. A lot of dudes out here are trying to take the Takashi route. And what happens is um, they find out that you can get more shine by dissing niggas and dissing neighborhoods. If I go out here and diss this whole neighborhood, it'll circulate on the net and I'm going to get more hits and then my music will blow up a little bit more. So y'all go into this deadly ass cycle of disrespecting the street, knowing that this shit is real out here. And again, I'm not trying to justify none of that shit when niggas are stabbing folks and all that. But I'm just saying, man, you don't play with fire like that. A lot of these dudes think, OK, if I go out here and diss niggas, that's going to get me more record sales. That's going to make me hot. All of the bloggers are going to talk about me and help me blow up like the Vlads and the academics who love pushing beefs. And again, there was a situation that happened in Miami where allegedly um, my dude got beat up by um, Jim Jones and his crew. Allegedly, I say that allegedly, Freddie Gibbs. I think Freddie Gibbs was, they had kind of a back and forth thing going on and they said Freddie Gibbs got touched up down in Miami. So... You know, I, I really wish cats get out of this whole dissing on the internet for clout and then taking it to the streets. If you diss folks, man, you know, sometimes it can be entertaining. Let it be entertaining on the internet, man. Don't don't take this thing to to another level. You know, because see, a lot of dudes, man, who talk this shit online, like Takashi. See, people like Takashi can talk shit like that and blow up. Takashi is protected by police. I want you to understand a lot of these niggas, <clears throat> these dudes you see jaw jacking and talking and all of this stuff online. A lot of these dudes are working with the damn police. A lot of these dudes are working with them folks. A lot of these dudes are working with the cops. So they can get online and talk greasy. You dig? Because they know they have police backing. So that's what it is. So I want my, my 
family to be careful out here. I want the family to be careful, especially black men. You know, I, I just don't give nobody points for harming another black person like that um, unnecessarily. Um, there's too many other enemies out here. You understand? It's too many other enemies. See, that's that's a prison mentality. What people do in prison, instead of looking to the guards to say, hey, like, what are we going to do about these prison guards? Niggas in prison say, well, I'm going to stab this nigga in my bunk. I'm going to go get this nigga in the, in the child line. It's, uh, you're still all in prison. You're still in a societal prison. Always understand that. All right. Now, a lot of folks in the room right now, hey, we need subscribers. We need 200,000 subscribers. We have almost 180,000. We want 200,000 subscribers. So we need to get that subscribe game popping. Now, I'm talking about the Jake Paul hype. YouTuber turned boxer, Jake Paul... Is Jake Paul the new great white hype? They've been hyping up Jake Paul for a couple of years now. He's been in a couple of significant fights. Um, Jake Paul, this guy, he's the, the chosen one for the dominant society. Understand, in white society, they always have to have a a fighter or an athlete that can dominate a black athlete. They've always that's been a thing with them. They've always needed that white athlete who can go toe to toe and dominate a black athlete. Um, this is very important in white supremacist culture. This is why Jack Johnson was such a problem. They had Jack Johnson, um, when the first big time heavyweight champ. And they would bring Jack Johnson out here and he would beat the brakes off these white men. He would beat these white men silly and white people reacted to it very negatively. When Jack Johnson would beat these white people after the fights, white people would go out and lynch black people. White people would go out and lynch black people. Um, they build up their boxing resume. Yeah, yeah, they're trying to, they're trying to build up... Um, Jake Paul's boxing resume. But but like I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this through history lane. Listen. So look, they've been looking for a great white hype for a long time. They've always, you know, Rocky Marciano. And Rocky Marciano, um, he wasn't shit. Um, and I say that because he fought when the mafia controlled boxing. And it has been proven and well documented that they made people take dives for Rocky Marciano. They made him take dives. I mean, they made other people take dives for him. Y'all remember the mafia was controlling boxing heavy, and they, you know, Rocky Marciano was their guy. You know, that was their guy. So they would go to Rocky Marciano's opponents and say, hey, look, you better take a dive in the fifth round, or your mother's going to get her knees broken. They were doing shit like that. So, they always understand the racial element of these fights. There's always a racial undertone to it. So, they've been looking for that great white hype for a long time. And in recent years, you got people like uh, Floyd Mayweather beating the hell out of all of these white fighters. And then they said, hell, we'll take a Hispanic fighter. Hell, that he's white enough. Just anybody non-black to beat these Negroes, especially Floyd Mayweather, with just anybody non-black, we'll take a Filipino, anybody, can somebody beat him? Oscar De La Hoya, anybody, can anybody beat him? Nobody could beat him. That's a blow to the white supremacist psyche. So they have to have the image of a white male knocking a black man down without the system of white supremacy helping them. But they still can't do it. So they, even if you see on the surface that a white person is knocking this black man down, understand the system of white supremacy is often still in play because they have set up and rigged the fight in many cases. That's the system of white supremacy in play. You yeah? 
They don't care about cheating, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to understand, white supremacist culture, they look at cheating differently than we look at cheating. This is why we lose to white supremacy so much. This is why they've dominated us. I want black people to understand this. Why did they dominate us so much? Black people instinctively, we look at certain things as instinctively not honorable, dishonorable, meaning harming a child in black culture, knowingly harming a child is dishonorable. There's absolutely no honor in that. If a black person harms a child knowingly, and everybody knows a black person harmed a child, the black person gets no points, no brownie points or nothing. That's a very dishonorable thing to do. You get no points. In white supremacist society, they have no problem harming kids. They have no problem bragging about harming kids. That's why they galvanized around each other when they harmed Trayvon Martin, who was a child. See, th that thing, that, 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 we're lost on that. We didn't get that. You people just sent a man out here, Zimmerman, to harm a black child. Well, that, that child had what's coming to him. And then we tried to appeal to some kind of moral thing because we don't think like that. We're not going to go harm a white kid. There's no, there's no honor in that. We're not going to go harm a white kid. We, we just don't look at that with any kind of honor. We have enough instinctive integrity to say, no, nah, we're not going to do that because we don't get no brownie points for doing that. Whereas in their culture, they get brownie points for doing that. Also, we don't, it's dishonorable to ambush somebody, to walk up and act like you're somebody's friend and act like you're trying to help somebody and then turn around and ambush them in, in black culture, in black society, that's always been dishonorable. If you do a deal with somebody as a man and y'all shake on it and you agree to the deal and somebody reneges on the deal, hey, man, you're not being a man. That's that's not honorable. I can't honor you. That You know, I can't respect that. That's how we have always been in black societies around the world. This is why the white supremacists came in and dominated because we really didn't understand the concept of of collective cowardice that they had. How they'll go in and y'all make a deal and as men, if we agree to something, okay, cool, let's do a deal, we, we do a treaty, um, you bring us some, some things to trade and then we'll bring you some things to, you know, we can trade. Yeah, you, you people look funny, but hey, I mean, you, you're on the planet with us, so I, I guess you can't be all that bad and I'm talking like aboriginal people around the world when they first encountered the white supremacists. This is how they looked at it. Hey, who, these are strange, pale-skinned people, but hey, look, if you got some things that you want to trade, hey, we, we've been trading with people in Africa. We've been trading with people over in Asia. So we, we've been trading with people. So if you have some, we'll trade with you. So let's make a deal. We'll give you this if you give us that. So when the white supremacists came through and started flipping and reneging on these deals, a lot of the aboriginal people really didn't understand that. I'm like, Hold on, man. Why, you said you were going to give something. I, if I give you something, you won't give it to me and you reneged on the deal. What are you doing? You understand? So they have no morality, man. We don't and we, we really don't understand the gravity of that. Because that type of mentality has been so foreign to us. That type of deception. Because it's so unmanly for a man to be deceptive to another man. That's always been seen, that makes you look like less of a man to a certain degree. This is why the white supremacists, in order for them to establish their male dominance, they need an entire system of militarized weaponry. You understand? In order to show their male dominance. We don't need that as black people. We don't need machines and military tanks and a system of racist judges and all that to show our manhood. It's like mano a mano. Let's me and you step over here and I'll show you how a man gets down. So people look at that as because the black male is the most masculine male on the planet. See, this is why they, they try to buck break us so much. Because if they can buck break us, the black male, they can buck break anybody. So in order to break us, in order for us to take a, an L, they have to use all types of trick knowledge. Let's go to this fight. This recent fight with 
Jake Paul, and Woodley. Now, Woodley, he was a, a UFC fighter, MMA fighter. Now, a lot of people are saying that this dude took a dive in this fight. You think? If you look at certain news blogs, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on one second. Let me look at, show y'all what some of the people are saying. Hold on. A lot of people are crying foul. Just look at, hold on. Hold on one second. All right. Let me go to my window here real quickly. Hold on, bear with me. Let me show y'all some of the things that people are saying out here. Uh, where are we at? Where are we at? Okay. All right. Right here. Here's some of the stories. People are saying, hey, Jake Paul versus Tyron Woodley. Some fans suggest the knockout was staged or rigged. Fans claim to have spotted proof the win over Woodley was rigged. So a lot of people are calling this out. It's not just me. A lot of people are saying, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You say Woodley wouldn't do that to his reputation on purpose. Let me tell you something. Look, certain these black athletes, let me tell you something. Once they get out of the main sport they're in, they don't have a lot of money that they're supposed to have. Let's be very clear. A lot of these black athletes, they make a grip. Once they get out of their chosen profession or the profession that they mastered, yeah, once they get out of that profession, their little money is funny. Sometimes their money is very funny. Let me tell you something. You think these niggas won't take a dive for some money? Look, they're trying to build Jake Paul up heavy. They're trying to make him a thing. And they're him boxing all of these people. And, all of, and I've been calling out these fights looking staged. I've been calling him out on that for a minute. All right? That Jake Paul, I've been saying for a few years... Hey, man, some of this stuff looks kind of rigged. Hold on, I'm going to go to my tweets. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on one second. Let me go to my tweets here. Hold on one second. Hold on. Okay, I'm going to show y'all a tweet from um, last year, as a matter of fact. November of last year. This is a tweet from last year. Jake Paul versus Nate Robinson fight was faker than the fire festival. This is 2020. I said some of these shits look fake, man. All right. All right, I I've been saying that. Now let me look, let me show the clip. Let me show y'all these clips of of um Woodley getting knocked out by Jake Paul. Now everybody has seen where it looks like Jake Paul gave a signal with his hand. Looks like he gave a signal, and then Woodley basically dropped his guard. You, you understand? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold on. That don't look right. But Woodley dropped his guard. Hold on. Let me let me show this. Okay, now let's look at this. And YouTube, this is fair use because I'm doing commentary. All right, so this is fair use. Now look at this. Hold on. All right. All right. Watch the wrist. Okay, he twisted the wrist. All right. All right. All right. And boy, look how excited they are. All right. Now, let's look at this thing from some different angles because there's some people who broke it down. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. So, if you look closely, he twisted his wrist as to give a cue. Like, okay, this is where the... The knockout punch is coming. Now look at look at the wrist. Slow down to let him know when to drop his hand. Now look at this. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Slow motion. Look at Jake Paul's wrist. Look at him. Give the cue. Right here. One. There you go. He That's the cue. All right. Now look at Woodley dropping his guard. He keeps dropping his guard after he got the cue. Now he's going to. Yeah, he keeps dropping his guard. Come on, dude. Dude, come on, man. 
Come on. Let's look at it from another angle. Look how dude just drops his guard like that on that slow-ass telegraphed punch. Somebody said it wasn't even a clean connection, which is true. It wasn't even no clean connection like that. But hold on. Hold on. All right. Now, look, he going to drop it. Look, how, look, he dropped his guard. Look at this. He dropped his guard when the punch is coming to take that punch. Look at that. Look at this, man. And he knew the punch was coming because he's turning his head. You drop your guard and then turn your head. What kind of shit is that? Come on, dude. <clears throat> really? <clears throat> Dude, you going you see him he done telegraph that punch and then you drop your guard. And Woodley, come on man, Woodley, this dude This dude was an MMA fighter, man. This dude has taken kicks to the head, punches to the head. This dude has taken real blows and ate them shits. But now this little old white boy done thrown this rigged ass telegraph punch and this took you out. Yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> really? Come on. Dude, the minute he, Jake Paul, telegraphed a little signal, then he dropped his guard and get knocked out. And then t while he's about to get knocked out, he dropped his guard and turned his head. If somebody's about to hit you, your first instinct is to block that. If you see a punch coming, nigga, let's, let's stop bullshitting. If you see a punch, Somebody swinging on you and you see it, you like that, nigga, instinctively. Somebody's about to hit you, you ain't gonna go and buck your eyes. Fuck out of here. Come on, man. How many they gave that? Did they give Woodley a bag? Like, Woodley, they gave him a dive bag. They gave him a dive bag, and the way he fell and laid out, that was funny style, too. That dude, did I think they gave him a dive bag, brother. Come on, family. Come on. A lot of y'all don't understand. Somebody said, you just mad because the white boy. Hey, man, look, if you're a white boy, there's some white boys who can brawl. I give some their credit, but yeah. But don't sit here and you telegraphing shit to niggas. And nah. Nah, you telegraphing punches. Nah. I I don't you know I don't believe you. You need more people. And then he the way he laid out, all right. The way he's laid out is funny style. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. The way he's laid out is very disturbing. Hold on. Look at this right here. Look how he laid out like this. This nigga feet all pointed in different directions. Who the hell lay like this? You get knocked out and you laying, <laughs> both of your feet laying like this, like a damn penguin. Look, you know, niggas will take a dive for money, dude. You hear? These folks will pay dudes off to take a dive so that they can blow up this dude's career. Don't don't y'all think for a minute that they ain't above that. Let me tell you something. And just because dudes were, were well-known fighters talking about their, what about their reputation? Dude, one word for that, Evander Holyfield. Nigga, did, some of y'all might not remember when Evander Holyfield fought Mitt Romney and then he, he was up there taking a dive for Mitt Romney. Some of y'all don't remember this when Mitt Romney and those guys did this old racist ass shit. Hold on, let me show y'all something. Hold on. Y'all don't understand how white supremacy works, guys. Y'all don't understand. Hold on. Hold on right here. This is Mitt Romney fought Evander Holyfield in like some kind of charity bout. Okay. And look, one of Mitt, they got this white man up here with some gold chains on. So y'all know it's real. It's going to be some bullshit. Y'all know it's going to be some bullshit. So look at this. Hold on. Here tonight in Salt Lake City, his political correctness. One win. Hold on. Let me go. Hold on. Y'all think y'all think motherfuckers won't take a dive? 
Hold on. Hold on. Hold. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Give me a knife. Family, you think these niggas, dude, they'll get out here and take a dive and, and pretend that a white person is whipping their ass for a bag? Don't y'all think niggas aren't above that, dude? <laughs> y'all up here talking about why would he ruin his career? Nigga, please. These dudes will go out here and take a dive for Mitt Romney. <laughs> they'll take a dive for anybody if the bag is right, dude. Reputation? Give me a break, man. <laughs> Dude. See, black folks be underestimating. Y'all y'all be underestimating nigga shit. But you know, niggas need some money. They'll do anything. All right, let's be real. Niggas do anything for some damn money. That's how they made us fucked up. And look, Evander Holyfield had a great reputation. He had a great reputation. Oh, somebody said, well, Mitt got hands. Oh, because... Oh, we got some coons in here now. Hell no, no. Mitt got them hand though. You, you just hating. Mitt Romney, well, you saying Mitt Romney can't beat the band of Holyfield? Everything ain't no conspiracy now. Oh, I see some niggas are bucking their eyes over that. <laughs> no, Mitt Romney, he's Mormon, man. Them Mormons can fight. I don't know what you're talking about. Silly niggas. <laughs> Y'all believe everything white people tell you. <laughs> Somebody, Mittens Romney. Mitt, Mittens Romney. <laughs> this Evander Holyfield, Evander Holyfield was on top of the world. I tell you, a lot of these dudes, when they get out the game, they lose their money. They don't know how to manage their money. They be out here tricking their money off. Child support, they get their money fucked up. Evander Holyfield was the dude. Evander Holyfield was sitting on major paper for a long time. In fact, um, that house that rapper Rick Ross owned, that used to be Evander Holyfield's house. That used to be Evander Holyfield's house. Rick Ross's house down there in Atlanta, that used to be Evander Holyfield's house because I used to go by there all the time. When I would go to Atlanta, I had friends who lived around there. My brother, L.A. Snow, who lived, he lived right around the corner from there. And my other guy, Tony Mercedes, lived right about a block or so away. So I would go out there all the time and pass that big um, estate all the time when Evander Holyfield owned it. So Evander had big paper. Yeah, so Rick Ross has that house now. So, so Jake bought Woodley, Woodley a watch. Okay, I didn't see that. But I just want y'all to understand. They'll pay dudes in order to, they'll pay brothers in order to take a dive to make the white guy look good. That's how important it is to maintain white supremacy, to, to have a great white hope. That's how important it is. They'll pay brothers to take that fall <clears throat> and give them a, a dive bag. You dig? It's real heavy. Y'all better understand how this game works out here, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Man, but listen. We got a, a new movie coming out. We got a new movie coming out about the Maroons. We're filming... This week, this weekend, we're filming. We're up in Santa Clarita. Um, a few of my, um, one of my, some of the people who listen, they came through. Shout out to the Meek Mills. It's a sister who has a food truck. Meek, her name is Mika. Her food truck is Meek Mills, and I hired her as the caterer. Very good food. Very, very good food. We had a huge cast up there in um, Santa Clarita. Um, but I have my, my, my homegirl, Mika, and her truck, I think her truck is all around L.A., but you can look her up, Meek Mills. <clears throat> she has like a Louisiana style, it's Louisiana style soul food, very good food. And let me tell you something, dealing on movie sets, especially when you're dealing with a large cast and crew, boy, it can be a headache. <clears throat> but we, we got everything, we, 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 we push through. Next time, I'm going to assign more duties to more people. Even my wife was on set helping out. We had a big crew, a lot of people. Well, we had about over 100 and something people on the, the cast and crew. And 
And when you do business, especially when you're dealing with a lot of people, I'm just trying to give people advice on what to do. Always try to have certain people who are designated to handle certain issues. Because when you're dealing with a lot of people, everybody's going to try to bring little petty problems to you. You got to have designated people for that. Uh, but it's spelled Meek Mills, M-I-K Mills. So... You know, sometimes I have I would have my production assistants come to me. You know, this person, um, they want to know this. They want to okay. Look, look, we're busy. We're on a time schedule. We're very busy. We got to shoot fast. We got to shoot very quickly because sun the sunlight goes down very early. So we're trying to rush to shoot, and I, I, I hired some some wardrobe people, and I had to get on their cases because they were really dragging ass, and I have to let folks know. Y'all can't drag ass and just kind of take your time. We keep telling you to get these people dressed, get these people dressed, get these people dressed. And they were kind of dragging ass and kind of eating up the time. Time is very valuable. When you're on a film set, you got to make sure that everybody's on point and they're not wasting time, especially if it's an independent project. Because what happens is a lot of times people think, OK, I'm getting paid, so I can just kind of take my time and kick back and drag my ass. Black folks, because I've had... So but my black folks, y'all can't have that mentality. Y'all better get off that shit. If you're going to do business, y'all got to know how to be very quick and very efficient when we do business when there's a lot of people involved. Because the dragging of the ass, that will slow everything down. I just want us to understand that, how we got to start handling business quickly and efficiently. No, but a lot of times when you're on these sets and when... We were preparing, you know, people started coming with a, you know, when you're dealing with, dealing with a whole bunch of people, they'll start bringing little things to you that you got to nip in the bud very quickly. One of my main actors, real good guy, he was a white guy. And even before we got on set, um, he sent me a menu of what he can eat. <laughs> uh oh. Hello, Tricky. He's like a very, you know, trained thespian. So, so motherfucker sent me a menu of what we need to feed him on set. I'm like, man, he sent me this list of family. Yeah, I said, yeah, do that on the white film. Do that on the white film budgets. But listen, this dude, this white guy, older white guy, and great actor, great actor. I think he's from the from Europe somewhere, but he's a great actor, great guy. But boy, he sent me, <laughs> and I, I told Ola, I had to call Ola about this. This motherfucker sent me a menu. Listen, Tariq, I am. I just want to give you a heads up. As a thespian, there's certain things that I would like to eat on set. These are some of the things that I can and cannot eat. Boy, he sent me this list, family. He was like, I am a vegan. I do not eat any meat products, nothing that comes from an animal. Where Ola? Ola, where's the, if Ola's in here, Ola, raise your hand. I, me and Ola was laughing our asses about this shit. We were laughing our asses off. Yes, I, 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 listen, I do not eat anything with animals. If there's any, even if there's a salad, the dressing must not come from animal products. If there's a salad, the dressing must come from balsamic vinaigrette that comes from olives that were um, cultivated in Italy. If I eat any kind of um, um, fruit, the fruit must be grown in Polynesia. If I eat any food with tomatoes, the tomatoes must have been ripened and germinated in the west coast of the San Francisco Bay. If I eat any um, asparagus, it must not have any type of germination on it. I'm like, dude. Man. <laughs> I'm going to get you a fucking McRib sandwich and some cilantro on it. And you're going to be happy, dude. Come on. I, bro, I called him personally. I, we ain't doing none of that, dude. <laughs> you're going to eat some of that meat meals, nigga. <laughs> you're going to eat you a soul food veggie wrap, my dude. Fuck that. <laughs> Man, please. Yeah, I said, yo, you have to bring your lunch, bro. 
Dude, I give you, I mean, I'm going to give you $2 for a Chipotle salad and a Yoo-Hoo, nigga. Man, this dude gave me this list with all this shit. I'm not doing none of that, dude. <laughs> Man, please. I swear to God, it was a long list of a whole bunch of shit. It, like, even if the vegetables have to be done a certain way. Listen, um, brother, listen, Tarek. If you give me any type of vegetables or salads, if there are chickpeas, the chickpeas must have been picked in the south of Wales by a, a virgin. Only virgin hands must have touched the chickpeas. Also, if there's going to be any kind of beverages, um, the beverages must come from specifically cultivated lemons if you're going to make lemonade. The lemons have to be germinated um, in the south of France. If there's going to be any type of... Um, um, bananas. They have to have been picked in um, Colombia. I do not eat Caribbean bananas, and the there must there must be some kind of sauce. If there's going to be any kind of sauce, the sauce must be gluten free, Tarek. I cannot drink none or eat non gluten free salt, uh, man, dude. Man, nigga, I'm about to get you an Impossible Burger. And a damn seven up, brother. And you're gonna be good. Man, you're gonna be good. But let me tell you something. What's funny? Let me tell you something about what's real funny. While we're doing the film, we're doing the casting. We're going to some of the casting agencies and putting the casting of what we're looking for. Um, we're like, yeah, we're looking for white males to play um U.S. military soldiers. We're looking for black males to play maroons. We're looking for um, sisters to play runaway slaves. So for certain things, most of those, we would get a, a moderate amount of, um, of people submitting their resumes. A, a moderate amount. But we, we hired who we needed to hire. But when we said, okay, we put a casting list for a slave owner. We need a plantation owner. Boy, the submission started flooding in. When we said <laughs> we need plantation owners, boy, the submissions, we couldn't get more. We couldn't get enough of them. Boy, they were submitting like crazy. Some of them were offering to work for free. So, okay. All right. Because we got a lot of scenes with, with plantation owners in the movie. Listen. <laughs> so, dude. So we, we, I had wardrobe, yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, a lot of them wanted to be slave owners. And guys, look, when, when they came to the set, when they came, hit the like button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the like button, guys, hit the like button. But listen, listen, when they came to set, some of these white people were coming to the set and we were going to put them in wardrobe, the ones who were going to play the slave owners. Now, the ones who were going to play the military soldiers, we had uniforms for them already. But we have some of the white people who are going to play the slave owners. And I was like, um, yeah, um, we're going to put you in wardrobe. We're going to put this vest on you. We're going to put this on you. And one, a couple of them were like, well, you know, hey, I got my own outfit. You know, that's like a plantation owner. I brought my own. I'm like, what a, why, why did you randomly have a, a slave owner outfit? It was multiple of multiple people who had their own slave owner clothes. I swear to God, I'm not making this up, dude. They they had their own clothes. One dude was like, hey, the tie you got, I don't like, I got a better tie than that. This tie, it had, he had like a Colonel Sanders tie. Yeah, this is one of my own ties right here and I got my own plantation owner outfit. I got some shoes. I like, they just randomly happened to have, and we, we had one scene where we had one of them about to whip some girl. And I bought these whips off Amazon. I bought some whips off Amazon. And we we're showing the guy, one of the guys playing the slave owner. I said, look, we're going to use this whip. I'm like, well, this whip, this is not, this don't look sturdy enough. I have a whip in my trunk I can go get. I'm like, <laughs> I said, okay, that'll be cool. And I'm thinking, I'm looking like, this motherfucker, why do you have a whip in your trunk, man? I, dude, 
These people have stuff that I, I'm assuming this stuff is passed down that these people have from their families. These dudes were coming to the set with authentic slave owner clothes that they owned. We didn't even have to dress them like that. They brought their own shit, dude. When you watch the movie, when you see the plantation owner guys, some of them, that's their own shit. I swear, dude, they're wearing their own clothes. We're looking real funny style. If I'm lying, I'm flying, dude. These folks had their own plantation clothes, dude. And when we're doing the scenes, the slave owner scenes, I was telling the, the people playing the slave owners, yo, y'all ad lib. I need you to just ad lib. What would you say if you were a plantation owner and, you know, you had slaves and they were acting up? So I had, you know, the black people, I had my black actors, my background actors, black men and women, they were in slave clothes. We had to, you know, make slave clothes for them. So they were raking and plowing in the fields. And we had the, the white person acting as a slave owner. And I was like, action, get your ass out there. Get your black ass out there. Pick that goddamn cotton. Get out there and do that. And I'm like, I'm feeling it. Oh, this shit is real. I'm, you know. Boy, these people are acting their asses off on this shit. Oh man, they were they go they should get an Oscar. The white people who played slave owners in my new movie, nigga, they should get a damn Oscar. They acted that shit out. They started to act it out so good. There was another scene where we had another guy. One of the guys who you know, had his own slave owner tie. And it got so good, some of the other, my slave actors, some of my, my brothers who were slave males, they started to get out of character for a second. The, the white guy was like, I gave him a whip. I was like, okay, action. Get out there. You want me to beat you? Get your ass out there and do what I told you. Pick all that stuff up. Pick that stuff up right now before I whip your black ass. And one of the brothers was like, hey. I said, no, 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 brother. Get back in character, nigga. Oh, okay. Oh, Lord. I'm sorry, master. I'm sorry. Buck your eyes, nigga. Y'all had to tell a nigga, ho. Oh, get back in character, brother. Yeah. So it got so real, some of my, my black folks started getting out of character. Like, hold up for a minute. Hey, Tyreek. Hold up. No, I ain't Tyreek, nigga. Don't talk to me, nigga. You a slave. Be a slave, motherfucker. Hold on. No, no. Get back in character, nigga. <laughs> yeah, this is about to be a for real revolution. <laughs> no, nigga, don't call my name. Don't no, nigga, you a slave. I didn't exist back then, motherfucker. Stay in character. So I had to remind niggas. Come on, this is a movie. Yeah, they about yeah. Hey, cause yeah, they don't mess my insurance up because they had the the um the film safety officers on my ass. With all them niggas up there doing, oh, they were whooping motherfuckers that they were doing flips. So they had the, the, the safety officer on my ass all day yesterday. Oh, white man from Orange County. Hey, Tarek. Interesting movie here. Wow. Wow. Very interesting movie here, Tariq. Uh, he was one of he was one of them Bob Barker white men. Well, listen, Tariq. Um well, interesting. Very interesting concept. Very interesting. Um, but listen, um, the guys over there with the machetes, I'm going to have to inspect those. I'm going to do a little inspection, okay, just, just for safety reasons, nothing personal. Um, okay. <laughs> One of those kind. Every every move the brothers made, he had to inspect everything. Okay, so listen, Tariq. Um, um, the guy over there, they're attacking the soldiers. Okay, it looks great. First of all, it looks great. Um, we have to make sure there's no, no physical contact, okay? Um, he, he got kind of close. Boy, he got kind of close there. We got to make sure there's no physical contact. You have to, you know, you got to go, you can swipe past. And when he jumps up and kicks, try to make sure that the kicks don't land. Okay. All right. He's one of them. Oh, God. He's he one of them real polite white men who act polite, but just own your ass all day. <laughs> he just popped out of nowhere. Every time the brothers would fight. But he just popped out of nowhere. This was a huge ranch we were on. We were on a huge ranch. And um, I had brothers whooping ass, dude. 
I had brothers whooping ass. Oh, the, dude. Somebody said, I, I, they have, I could, I know they have their own clan robes. Family, these folks, that's why all them clan robes, they pass them things down. All of them slave owner clothes. Remember, guys, the, a lot of these people's families were slave owners. The clothes and the memorabilia, they keep that shit in the family, man. They keep that stuff in the family, dude. Oh, man, I had some brothers doing some phenomenal stuff. Boy, I had some brothers doing flips and kicks. I had them doing phenomenal stuff. Oh, man, these brothers was getting busy in this one. But, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about Kamala Harris in a minute. But, um, yeah, they won my ass. But the, the white people on the set, boy, they were acting their asses off. They were very convincing. I had to let brothers know, stay in character. Stay in character. And I, I had to remind him. And in my, um, I had another guy who was my first AD. That means your first assistant director. Um, James, good guy. Very, I love this guy. Older white guy. And I'm going to have him on, on a lot of my movies. He, he held things down. Very good. Very good, thorough guy. And um, it was funny because when we had to, when we shoot one shot in one location, we would have to move to another location after the takes. And it, again, the way he would announce the characters, you know, that would kind of ruffle niggas. He's like, okay, all right, great take, guys. So what we're going to do, guys, we're going to do another scene on the other part of the pond. So we're going to need all of the Indians, and I'm going to need all of my slaves to come on over here. Brother, what, 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 what? Oh, oh, oh. Niggas had to remind themselves. <laughs> okay, all of my slaves, let's go down here. Okay, all of my slaves, we're going to do lunch. <laughs> what? Just go down to Meat Mill's truck, man, damn. Go down to the meat mills truck. Man. But it was a fun shoot. Yeah, it was a fun shoot. It was a very, very fun shoot. Very, very fun shoot. <laughs> man. Oh, man, yeah, the brothers, that was, that was throwing brothers off for a second. That was throwing niggas off for a second. I, 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 I should have been filming a lot of that behind the scenes stuff. And I had Mateo, my son, Mateo on the scene. I, I, where's that scene? I got to show y'all that. I had Mateo in a scene. And Mateo was supposed to just look sad. It was a situation where some people got killed and Mateo and it was another child. They were on the ground. They were supposed to look sad. And Mate, Mateo's little ass kept breaking character. I said, okay, action, Mateo. Look sad. He looked, that good, Dad? I think. Let's not break character, Mateo. He, he goes, That's good? Mateo, stop saying is that good. Stay in character, Mateo. You got to look sad. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, okay, that's good. All right, damn it, Mateo. <laughs> no, it was a fun shoot. Yeah, it was. It was a fun. It was fun because we were getting a lot of work done. You know, there's trials and tribulations. I, we didn't get, we didn't shoot all the shots we needed because it got dark on us very fast. It got dark on us very, very fast. I mean, where's Mateo? I'm going to show y'all Mateo's picture. Him and the other little girl. We had another little cute girl on set. Look at Mateo. That's Mateo on set right there. And the other little girl, very cute girl. And Mateo, boy, if there's a girl somewhere around, Mateo's right there. Look at Mateo. That's them on set. Ain't that cute as hell? That's a little cute girl. She, we had her on there. That's Mateo. Man. <laughs> oh, he was having a ball. Oh, Mateo was having a ball out there. Man. So, all right. But yeah, the movie, man, it's, man, it's a great movie. Uh, again, I'm going to shoot some more follow-up scenes. We're still working on it. But yeah, very good very deep film. Very good film. And we got a lot of good fight scenes. Um, yeah, man, we started losing light early. So I was scrambling to try to get as many of the shots I needed because out there, we're on we're in a ranch in the middle of nowhere. 
and it is pitch black. I'm talking about pitch, 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 pitch black. You can't see nothing. And there's animals out there. There's coyotes and deer and there's everything out there. But we, we had a great time. All right. Now, that situation with um, Kamala Harris, people are talking about that. Kamala Harris was on Charlemagne's show. And um, Kamala Harris tried to get into her performative sister girl act. She started sister girling it up when Charlemagne asked her a question. And then Simone Mammy Sanders popped in trying to run interference. Oh, this was sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. And they, the, the, the Biden sexuals are trying to make it seem like, oh, Kamala Harris, well, she gathered Charlemagne. She didn't gather nothing. She didn't gather anything. Let me play this clip. And this is fair use, fair use because we're doing commentary. Fair use, fair use, commentary, fair use. Now, this is Kamala Harris. And watch Simone Sanders try to run interference. The superhero that's going to speak against Joe Manchin. No. I want to know who's the real president of this country. Is it, Bi is it Joe Biden or Joe Manchin? I'm sorry. I just want to interrupt and I'll take the vice president to hear you. It's Simone. I'm so sorry, Charlie. We have she to have now that's Simone Sanders. That's Simone Sanders running interference because she was, I guess, trying to stop Kamala Harris from answering that question. So they they have her as the damn crash dummy for everything. Hold on. She can hear me. <laughs> can you hear me, Madam okay, Vice President? So I'm sorry. You got a rap. Oh, so I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. They're acting like they can't hear me. I can hear you. Oh, so who's the I real? So who's the real president of this country? Is it Joe Manchin or Joe Biden, Madam Vice President? Come on, Charlemagne. I really Come on. It's Joe Biden. I can't no, tell. No, 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 no. It's Joe Biden, and don't start talking like a Republican about asking whether or not he's president. Oh Lord! And let me tell you something. And that's the go-to argument. Every time we criticize them, they say, well, you sound like a Republican. I told people that's a talking point that comes from the top. That comes from the top Democratic brass. Whenever we start criticizing the Democrats, oh, that you sound like a Trump supporter. That Trump talk, you sound like... That's a talking point that they didn't figure it out as a deflection in one of these think tanks, all right? So now she's sister girling it up now. Give me a break. Hold on. Hold on. Where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Let me put this back. Hold on. Do you think Joe Manchin and, is and a problem? It's Joe, and, it's Joe, and it's Joe Biden, and I'm vice president. My name is Kamala Harris. And the reality is because we are in office, we do the things like the child tax credit, which is going to reduce black child poverty oh, by 50%. Oh, shit. Oh, that's one of them lift all programs. Oh, that's why you should be checked and called out because you, you're naming these lift all programs, Kamala. Kamala's uh, fair use, by the way, YouTube, fair use. We're doing commentary, fair use. All that talking crazy. When they, they get to talking to black folks. Oh, now you're point. You listen up, Charlemagne. Honey child. Oh, little, shut up. Waving the finger. Whenever they talk to black folks. That's that Obama thing. Y'all get to talking to black folks and y'all waving your finger around and you sister girl and man, please, we got a right to ask you what we need to, to ask you. Don't start telling us about all these lift all programs that that's going to trickle down to us. No, 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 no. We ain't playing that game, Kamala. We're not playing it. Hold on. Let me play the rest. Hold on. Hold on. On track to do that. We do things that are about saying that our Department of Justice is going to do these investigations and require that we end chokeholds and have body cameras. Stop. Okay. So, look, does it sound like she's been drinking? It is the work of saying we're going to get lead out of pipes and paint because our babies are suffering because of that. We, we want reparations. Why does she sound drunk? It is the work of saying people who ride public transit deserve the same kind of dignity that anybody else. She sounds like Chaka Khan did in the verses. Does. So let's improve that system. It is the work of saying that we have got to bring down prescription drug costs because folks who have diabetes should not be dying because they don't have enough money in their pocket. Okay, shut up. Because she sounds like a drunk-ass Chaka Khan. 
Listen, I had a lift y'all at. What we gonna do? I look. Uh, my name. I'm. I'm Kamala Harris. What we gonna do? I got a program that's gonna lift poverty. That's gonna make a happy meal that black kids are gonna get to eat. Then that's gonna stop um leaded gas from polluting black neighborhoods. Okay. I got a program that's going to give school lunches. You're going to have Lunchables with orange juice and soy milk for everybody, which includes black people. Shut up. Stop. She sounds drunk. The hell out of here. All that rambling. Give me a damn break. She sound like she's on the pipe right now. Yeah, Charlemagne asked some legitimate questions. Real talk. That's very legitimate. She didn't gather anybody. The Biden sexuals are trying to spin this as if she gathered somebody. Doing all. And that's why Simone tried to stop her, because Simone knew she was about to put her foot in her mouth. Simone got her thick ass out there. Going, okay, we, we got to go. Uh, uh, Charlemagne, we gotta go. Popeye's chicken about to close. We gotta go right now. Uh, thank you, Charlemagne. We have to go. Uh, uh, I got this. I am, my name is Kamala Harris. Shut up. <laughs> Lord. Yes, uh, Charlemagne gathered her. Yes. Man, please. This is a mess, boy. Where are y'all Biden sexuals at right now? Where are the Biden sexuals? Where y'all at, man? Boy, I'm tired of these fake folks. We got to call these fake people out. We got to call the fakeness and the phoniness out, ladies and gentlemen. That has to be called out. We don't have time for that. We do not have time for it. Speaking of phony, did y'all see... Um, that that Minnesota cop, Kim Porter, she killed this brother, Dante Wright. Y'all remember when she shot this brother out there in uh, Minnesota and lied and said, oh, I thought I had my taser. Now, this woman was a decorated cop for many, many years, decades, but she didn't know the difference between a gun and a taser, which is a lie. That's their justification for killing black people. So she killed this brother and she evidently went to the Kyle Rittenhouse school of fake Dry eye crying, okay? She's another person who did some of this dry eye crying, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. Let me show y'all this woman here. Let me show y'all here her. Here she goes. The same MO. They kill, they kill somebody, then they get on the stand and do this fake ass dry eye cry. Hold on. And nothing happened. And then... <laughs> Can you proceed or not? Yes, it's fine. Okay. After the driver said you shot him, do you remember what you said, or do you, if you don't remember, did you look at the video and see what you said? Or, <laughs> Do you actually remember what you said, I guess is my question, not with help from a video. I don't remember what I said. Teaser, teaser, teaser. And nothing happened. And then he told me I shot him. Oh, Lord, give me a damn knife. Give me a damn knife. Shut your ass up. Man, please. Lord, did y'all see a tear? I didn't see one tear. Boy, only those in the dominant society can get on a stand on national television and do this fake crying. And notice how the white media never calls them out with this fake ass crying that Rittenhouse and little mayonnaise lady, 
Nobody calls this out in the white media. They're these fake ass dry crying. Now, if a black person got up there, oh, no, I didn't mean to shoot no white people. I, I, I didn't mean to shoot white people. <laughs> All the news networks be like, this lying Negro, there was a lying nigger on the stand today. A lying, fake crying nigger was on the stand. That'd be the headline. <laughs> Oh, they'll have all types of experts. Yes, we have a body language expert saying that this nigga was lying. Yes, we have a, a world-renowned teardrop expert who said this nigga had no tears. Oh, they would have every expert and pundit pointing out the fact that this nigga's fake crying. Oh, they would have every body language expert imaginable calling it out. Stop. They got these fake-ass people on here. Dry eye crying, and they go along with it. A, a person, this this former police officer, breaks down on the stand. She didn't break down. Stop. Yeah, we don't get the luxury of fake crying. All right, we don't get the fake cry. Allowing fake crying is white supremacy. All right. Allowing fake crying is white supremacy. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, they would have a teardrop expert. Oh, they love doing that. When it's black folks, oh, they they have all of these body language. When, the minute you start seeing body language experts, that's propaganda. That's them trying to manufacture a story. That's them trying to manufacture a narrative. Yeah. Oh, they're cold, man. These folks are cold blooded, man. They do things very ritualistically, man. Yeah. They always give people the benefit of, uh, benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And they do a lot of things extremely ritualistically. Just like when, um, speaking of murderers, Dylan Roof. A lot of stuff they do, they did some ritualistic things with him. Um, Y'all remember, what did they do with Dylan Roof when um, he killed all those black people? What did they do with Dylan Roof? What did they do to Dylan Roof right after he killed those people? Yeah? What did they do with him? Hold on. Hold on one second. Excuse me. When, yeah, when Dylan Roof killed those people, they took him to Burger King. Remember that? Do y'all know that's kind of a ritualistic thing for mass shooters, for young mass shooters? That's kind of a ritual thing. Family, remember the other day I was telling you guys about this white girl who's a woman now in the 1970s, Brenda Ann Spencer. This white woman who did one of the first well-known mass school shootings in 1979, okay? Brenda Spencer, this is her in 1979 when she got arrested. This is the white girl who shot up a school across the street from her house. And when they asked her why she did it, she said, well, I did it because I hate Mondays. A lot of folks don't know now, the term Monday is a code word for black people, especially out there in Boston, places like that. But in, in a lot of white supremacist enclaves, the term Monday has always been, it's been for, for many, many years, a euphemism for black people. It's, it's like a running joke. Um, why do, the, the joke is, this is the joke. The, this is an old white supremacist joke. The joke is, what do black people and Mondays have in common? Everybody hates Mondays. That's the joke. That's an old school white supremacist joke. So as a code, they use the term Monday to describe black people because everybody hates Mondays and everybody hates black people. But with this woman here, the, the, the white girl who shot up the school, she didn't surrender at first. She wouldn't surrender for a minute. So this is her, Brenda Spencer. And let me show y'all something. To get her to surrender, hold on one second, hold on, where's this? 
to get her to surrender after surrendering to the police. Right here, read this. She surrendered because they promised her a Burger King meal. They promised her a Burger King meal. They took her to Burger King, ladies and gentlemen, after she killed all those people. They took this white girl to Burger King. Family, these people do a lot of things very ritualistically. This same white girl who shot the, one of the first modern mass shootings, mass school shootings, the woman, the girl at the time, they took her ass to Burger King, ladies and gentlemen, and got her a Whopper. You understand? Boy, these white, they stay on code no matter what. Just like Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof was not the first one to get a Whopper. Dylan Roof was not the first one to get a damn Whopper. When have you ever heard them taking a black person who shot somebody to get a Whopper? You understand? That's a ritual. When they do stuff like that, they do little codified ritualistic things. That's a codified ritual, dude. You understand? Yeah, somebody said Burger King stands for BK, black killer. Yeah. These people do things very ritualistically. We have to understand that part of the game when it comes to them, man. Yeah, Dylan Roof got a whopper. So did she. Man. We better know what we're dealing with. We got to be on code too. We got to be on code heavy. But anyway, man, let me go in here. I got business to handle, man. Um, again, we, we're selling the autographed copies of my great book, Foundation of Black American Race Beta, one of the best-selling black history books on Amazon, ladies and gentlemen. You can get it on Amazon. If you want it now, you can get it on Amazon. If you want to get the autographed hardcover copy, go to officialfba.com, ladies and gentlemen. Officialfba.com, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let me get up out of here, man. We had a great conversation tonight, great broadcast tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And you guys have a